on today's show, we're going to talk about editors. What kind of editors are there? There's a lot. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we encourage, inf inform, encourage, and support Christian <laughs> Indie Writers on the journey toward publication. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian fiction. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. We are so happy that you are all here with us today. If you are with us live, you know how we feel about you guys. We just love y'all. Um, but if you are um, new to this or you're just checking us out as a podcast, we appreciate you as well. So if you like what we do here, if you find us helpful and you want others to be encouraged as well, we'd appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to us wherever you listen to us. Um, so today... On this show, on every show that we do. Oh, hi, Piper. Piper's here in our live chat already. Hi, Piper. I'm having a bad day. Like, I'm just going to stop right now. I'm tired. I've not been sleeping well, so I apologize in advance for, like, the craziness of this episode. But before we go any further, we always start each of our episodes with a segment that we call the What's Up. It is a time for the host and those in our live chat to share what has been going on in our lives, uh, any sort of like updates since last week. And I'm going to start with you, Jamie. What's up with you, hon? Blah. Um, lots. So I just wanted to take my What's Up time and talk about different kinds of personality profiles. I know that we have taken the strength finders sort of mm -hmm. together. It was something that, and I loved it because unlike other personality profiles, it really focused on discovering your strengths. Whereas I've often felt in the past that the point of a personality profile was to figure out where you're terrible and how you need to improve because <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was interesting though, because I just retook the D I S C and I don't know if you guys know anything about that particular profile test, but what the reason that I'm bringing it up is because when I took it before I got high in I, which is influence mm -hmm. and low in S, which I think is like stability. Okay. okay. And granted, this was like in my la my past life as a young person. And I took it and I got high S and low I. And it was just difficult for me because as I'm taking this test, it's like, but who am I really versus who have I trained myself to be? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because ultimately those tests aren't supposed to change, correct? Like it's just right. supposed to be who you are. So yeah. what you're discovering about yourself is that in a lot of ways, you, um, Jamie is who you construct Jamie to be in order to fit in and to be accepted by those that are around you. And I think that the reason why it's changing for you, your test scores, is because you are coming to find that Jamie is okay as Jamie. Right. And Jamie is lovable as Jamie. And I just appreciate that you're open about that and sharing that. Well, and I thank you for saying it. So I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Uh, been really revelatory. Mm -hmm. I agree. Like I did take that test before too. And like, um, it didn't impact me the same way that strength finders did. And the way you said that was, I never thought about it, but that is true in a lot of ways uh, that test and other personality tests were just kind of like, okay, so here's what your personality is now. How do you fit it? Uh, how do you take that and try to fit it into the round peg or the square peg is kind of how, yeah. you know, yeah. as opposed to strength finders, which is like, all right, here's your strengths. Yeah. This is what you bring to the table. Yay come to the table because this is what you get to do that other people can't do. Right. right? And I, I love that. So that's yeah. very true. I took that test as part of the strengths for writers course that I took. Mm -hmm. She actually had you take like four different ones sure. and um, they used it to enhance the strengths finders. Oh. And so like, are you data responsive or are you not? And like stuff like that. So they were, they were kind of used to like, okay, here's how you would, 
and I don't know if the disc was the data responsive one or if it was another one that we did, but like I'm highly data responsive and my score in one of those tests showed that. Mm. And in addition to the strengths finder. So it was yeah. really helpful in that context. Well, and I think that um, it's, it's something about my particular personality that makes me see these tests as tools for self-flagellation. <laughs> <laughs> no, for, you know, self-improvement um, uh, type of resources instead of what they can be, which is absolutely empowering. Yes. So I don't think it's necessarily like the fault of the tests or something or even the people who administer them. It's just mm -hmm. sort of um, something that I just noticed. And so mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you articulated it so well, Jen. Thanks a million. Well, Piper says that she definitely agrees. We definitely find Jamie lovable as Jamie. Yes, we do. Piper also says that it's a Myers-Briggs that is data responsive one. Okay. Mm. And she took it and got high stability, the, the disc um, personnel. I never took the disc one, I don't think. I guess it was a Myers-Briggs. I don't remember I what I got. So, oh, and Teresa is here too. Good morning, oh, Teresa. We saw you write. I saw that you did your writing and you posted it in the group. I have not looked at yet because I didn't want to think about the prompt before I had to. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to think about it at all. One more thing before we leave, Jamie. Um, I did chew her out earlier, both Tina and I did, because she did not mark herself as safe on Facebook. And even though we had been seeing that she was safe and I'd actually talked to her myself, if Facebook doesn't <laughs> tell me that you're safe, then... From you know, Hurricane you know. Ian, specifically. Yeah. How are we supposed it's, to know? It's so interesting because where I live, it was seriously just like a rainy day. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I suppose I heard like the wind in the tops of the trees, but nothing kind of whipping down the street feeling. Um, mm -hmm. And there's itty bitty little branches all over the place. But like, it really did not feel like a hurricane happened. Right. I did lose power, but fortunately it was like, way late at night and I was debating with myself about whether I should get some sleep and go at it again in the morning or if I should just work through the night. So the power going out made that choice for me. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I woke up in the morning, I like, I woke up to the sound of my air conditioner kicking on. So mm -hmm. it was, I mean, kudos to like the Duke energy people. Um, I, the spectrum internet was out for half a day. Uh, after the power came back on, but again, repaired like right away. I really got to say like the power people and the internet people down here are like the salt truck people up north. <laughs> they're oh. ready and they're like, we're going to deploy en masse to get it all fixed. And they really came through for me personally. So thoughts and prayers, of course, people. to everybody who mm -hmm. really experienced it, but that was not me. I was safe and sound. Right. I was just going to say that too, is that like that some people did get really bad and we do need to be praying for them. Yeah. Um, the power and internet people up here in Michigan are not like that. No, no. We'll get like, to you after we're done shoveling the snow is how it is. Maybe. Right? Mm -hmm. I guess so. So, all right. So, um, my what's up is, um, I got some more editing done, still not to the finish line with it yet, but I'm really happy about that. Um, we're heading down to our camper today to pack everything up, uh, possibly winterize it, but at least pack up and bring the stuff home that we got to bring home. And, um, I guess that's it. Like, uh, it's puppy chaos around here, but in a good way with the, with both puppies. And I did tell you guys that about the puppy last week, right? Didn't I share that? What's up that we got Phoebe, a puppy. Well, if yes. I didn't. If yes. Oh, yes. You absolutely yeah. did. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's a very cute puppy. And you know what I've got to say, Jen, is, isn't it nice to just kind of have like normal people problems? Like instead of no big giant life is hard problems. So right. I'm so happy for you that you just got <laughs> the doing that. life thing going on. Good I mean, you. it's still in the background bubbling. I'll be honest. Yeah, like, you know, for sure. morning is, you know, a, a hard thing. And, um, a couple of things this week kind of like reminded me like I have a woman in my church that um, I had talked with at camp at the campgrounds and um, she was going through something similar. Her mother was older than my mom um, and she's older, but still, it's still a hard thing to go through. And she, her mother just passed and she, and so Aww. that kind of brought up more, you know, brought it back up to sure. the surface for me again. Mm -hmm. And then there's a podcast that I listened to the, um, the wish I had known 
podcast. If you haven't heard that, it's a pretty decent, uh, good podcast. And um, I, the ladies are just very sweet on there. And one of them is her her um, sister is dying of cancer, and it's like the <sighs> end stages, and it's it just takes me back to my aunt Yvonne again. And it's just mm-hmm. like been a, you know, it's just so there'll be things when you lose someone that you love or people that you love. Like there will always be things that um, that just take you back to there, and, and that's okay. That's all right to, as again, like great love, you know, you know, great uh, sorrow is because of great love, right? I don't remember how the quote goes, but for sure. So, all right, we have some what's up happening in the chat. Piper says her what's up. I have one more scene to write and my first draft is done. That's all amazing. Cast. That's awesome. <laughs> Long time coming for her. And Barbara is back. She says, LOL, commented on wrong vid. Good Oopsie. morning. She says, miss being here. We missed you too, Barbara. Yeah. We're glad you're back. Um, let's see. Teresa's what's up is researching story and series structure. And my brain is going to explode. <laughs> yeah. So. She's drinking really through that fire world. hose. Yeah. <laughs> and Barbara, thanks for your prayers. I really appreciate that. All right, Christina Katane, what is up with you, my friend? Well, I don't know if anybody noticed, but while you were giving the intro, my desk totally fell apart. <laughs> what? <laughs> She okay, the intro was a, was a was a mess anyway. Like I told you, were like, saying like, "Thank you for being here." I'm like, because this is not a real desk. Uh-huh. This is a sewing desk. Okay. So it has this little panel right here in front of me that you can lower down. So when you put your sewing machine on it, it's level. The part you yeah. sew on is level with the top yeah. of the desk. But I bet it's great for a keyboard. Well. There's these bolts <laughs> that hold it on to the level that you want well, it on. Uh-huh. And one of the bolts came off. Oh, nice. And it was like, that's oh, why no. I spilled my coffee earlier. Remember I told you I oh, spilled yeah. my yeah. coffee? Because the, one of the bolts was off. And when I p- touched it, the thing went like this. And my coffee went flying. Oh, so you, as, the, as the intro was playing, I'm trying to screw the one bolt that came out in. And in the process, I knocked the other side down like three rungs. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was sitting here trying. And I have this huge, like, mouse pad desktop thing that covers my entire desk. It's mm-hmm. like the material of a mouse pad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to pull that off. Like, I'm trying to, like, discreetly like, <laughs> fix my desk. That's awesome. I have one of those mouse pad things too, except for it's not a mouse pad thing. I wanted one and I, I just didn't have any money at the time. And I had this uh, really crappy yoga mat from Five Below. And so that's what I use. It's not as good Look as one, you. But, hey, thrifty. Well, mine's on the floor oh. over there right now because I just kind of yeah. threw it. Oh my gosh. If you ever watch this podcast and think, man, I could never be that professional and do the same. Yes, you can. You can be as professional as we are, especially with days like You know, today. you don't have to wear pants because the camera's like great. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. yeah, please do wear pants. I'm wearing a dress, by the way. I might not be wearing pants. but um, And I have some stuff that I got to move down on my Kanban board this week. So I'm really happy about that. Oh, it's good. Exciting. That's exciting. Oh. For those of you that don't know what that it means, when she moves stuff down, it means that she's accomplishing things. So yeah. that's the, the fun. So the bottom row is the done section. And then I was able to move stuff from the to be done section to the this week section. And then it'll go down again. That's very fun. Very yeah. exciting. Things are happening, right? So yeah. And I'm going says, to book fair tomorrow. So <gasps> oh, that's right. That's that's a big thing, actually. You're gonna go sell some books, right? Yeah, I hope so. Do a plug. Where is it in case people are local? It is in Livonia, Michigan, and it is the Livonia Book Festival. It's the first inaugural. I guess that was redundant, right? The Mm. first inaugural. (laughs) Yeah, will there be a second inaugural? (laughs) <laughs> it's the inaugural and not I can't even say that. It's the first one. <laughs> and it's in the Livonia Elks Club from nine to five tomorrow. Exciting. So come get a signed copy of either one of my books or both. And the more you buy, the more discounted it is. Hmm. Exciting. All right. And Piper says, LOL, Tina being all discreet, <laughs> then totally outing herself. That's kind of our <laughs> MO, right? That's basically what we do. Well, like, I didn't want to distract anybody from what you were saying. <laughs> it's fine. I'm sure it wasn't. You saw how bad it was what I was saying, right? Actually, like... I wasn't paying attention. Because... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you hadn't told me, I would have known. <laughs> oh, mercy. All right, ladies. 
So this week's episode, we'll finally get into it now. Um, oh, before we do that, we appreciate you continuing to pray for our friend Rhonda, the fourth host and the fourth corner of this uh, foundational podcast that we do. <laughs> Lord, uh, she is um, still out on sick leave. We love you, Rhonda, if you're listening and been praying for you. And yeah, so, okay. So moving on into today's topic. Um, Teresa says, do that. That's only 50 minutes from her. It's only what? 50 minutes for me too. Wow. Wow. Probably in an Ooh. opposite direction though. I'm guessing. I think that we have a lot of listeners in Michigan. Didn't we discover that a little bit ago that there was quite a few that were like nearby? Like we Leah's have, in Michigan. Leah's yeah, in we, Michigan. Yeah. We totally need to have a writing retreat. And I, there's somebody else too, but I can't think who it is and I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, well, wrong. And if you're not in Michigan, you need to move to Michigan because clearly all the cool <laughs> writers are here. This is like the writing Mecca. Yeah, obviously. Jamie. Yeah. yeah, Jamie. We were just talking about that. That's funny. Okay. All right. So today's topic, we're going to be talking about editors and um, what the different kinds. And because the reason why we talk want to talk about this is because honestly, I'm just sick of hearing people say, you know, well, there's seven types of editors or there's this and then mm -hmm. nobody agrees. If you go to Google right now, because <laughs> you tried it just to see if you go to Google to see how many different kind of editors there are, you're going to find every single website disagrees with each other. And I'm not just talking about the average blogger that's trying to start a writing blog or anything. I, we're talking like the big people, like we're talking about, you know, different famous writing websites and famous um oh like christian um like resource resources pages. And yes, are exactly. you talking like read z for example or... yeah i wasn't gonna out anybody oh, because sorry. That's, that's okay <laughs> because, just because we don't agree with everything that all of these different places are saying um because from experience now could they be right could there be like seven different steps? Yes. A person could actually absolutely take that route. Do you have to? That's where the arguments began. Sure. Right? Because, you know, once upon a time when the only way to get published was to send your manuscript off in a big fat envelope with a prayer, um, mm -hmm. you would then get to the publishing house and then they have a process at the publishing house. Right. And mm -hmm. it's possible that the the myriad of rounds of edits that a publishing house puts a manuscript through to get it market ready is where some of this thinking comes from because right. they're tasked with turning out a particular product that has to check particular boxes and they have standardized the process by putting it through these bajillion steps right and i would absolutely agree with that but i would also question that premise that mm -hmm. they're putting out I think it's just because it's how it's always been done. Ah, I don't really think good. that it's putting out a better product because I read traditionally published books as well as indep independently published books. And I find just as many mistakes and problems. Oh, if and I said poor better? writing and poor <laughs> plotting and boring books in traditionally published fields as I do in the independently published fields. Sure. So, I didn't for, mean better. I just meant like a certain type of product. Right. So, I see. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. And I would, oh. and I, I kind of have this sinking feeling or suspicious feeling that there's just a bunch of people out there trying to make money off the publishers and <laughs> oh goodness, like mm. oh let me do this for your books and yeah. so then that just takes money out of the author's pocket because every other person that the publisher has to pay is less money in our pockets. Mm. True, right, and again, like. But I'm a pessimist sometimes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we love about you. Okay. So what we did is we sat down, we talked about how we actually, and we disagree too. We don't do the exact same editing process, but it's similar. It's close enough that we feel that this is kind of like the bare bones. This is what you should be doing for editing. Now, next week, we're going to talk about how to find editors because the question came up. A listener um, commented in one of our YouTube videos that they went back and watched and asked and that. And so if you, if you comment on our videos and you ask questions, we will come back and answer them. It may take us a few weeks in an episode or we might answer it immediately, but we do check our comments. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and, and ask it below in the comments, even if you're not live right now with us. Yeah. And just another touch on the bare bones thing. Uh, just a reminder, we understand that so many aspiring writers are, 
um, people who are in a single income household and there isn't a yeah. whole lot of money to spend on a majillion pass throughs, even at half a cent a word, you're talking a pretty big price tag when you get into 80,000 words and a nano novel at 50 K is not even, I mean, that's the shortest possible length of a novel. So at half a cent a word, you're shelling out a pretty good chunk of change is like a grocery, uh, bill for some people. So, right. um, so, we're talking bare bones just so that you're not embarrassed. Wouldn't you say? Right. right. And we're going to be talking the financial aspects of it next week when we talk about how to find an editor and Great. like that. So we decided that like we concurred that we always start with what we like to term the bestie read through. <laughs> if you're like in a reading group or if you have, um, alpha readers like that, because see, that's what I'm saying. We all kind of do it differently, but we all have some sort of bestie read through. And it's before Tina was saying it's before the self edit. Like it would sometimes we like don't we I'll have something. And I'm like, I don't know if this works. And guess what? Who I'll reach out to. I'll reach out to one of these ladies and get some feedback from them. Tina says that she's reached out. Tell them how you do it, Tina. Well, I have three books that, and this is my third book and this is my third process. So <laughs> <laughs> um, still looking for your process, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to find the perfect one. So the, this, the second book alone, I actually sent it out to Piper and she did a quick read through, not, not looking for any grammar, punctuation, anything like that, just the overarching story and what she, and her thoughts about it as a reader. Mm -hmm. And this time I have alpha readers. If you want to sign up, send me an email at menopublishing.com or at gmail, menopublishing at gmail.com. Um, and I'm sending it out 10,000 words at a time with a questionnaire. And when they fi finish one to 10,000 words and send me back the questionnaire, then I'll send them the next installment. Right. Because I knew, like your theory is why edit something that isn't working? Right. And if right. and mm. often we know that there's a problem, but we just can't figure it out. So that's for me. And I, I don't send out the entire work beforehand, but I definitely reach out for certain chapters or ask for help in certain areas because if it, I just feel like it's not working. Right. So, so that's there are the, certain things that I have had happen repeatedly with, which I say repeatedly, but twice mm -hmm. <laughs> where I have trouble, like getting the emotion on the page, for example, right. Or there's things in my head that I know that I don't understand that the reader doesn't get. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have made sure that there are those questions on my questionnaire. Oh, good. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So then that is the before the self edit. And then y'all know how we feel about self editing, that it's so, so important that you need to spend a lot of time there. You need to, you know, we have episodes on this. I think two different where I just kind of like really sh go in deep about how I self edit. So the next step would obviously be self editing. Well, then as we were planning this episode, we came, we did come across one website that we were like, yes, that's absolutely it. That's what we do. And they had a graphic and y'all know we love graphics. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share that graphic right now. Now this is from, oh, it doesn't show the website. Darn it. I want to give the website credit. So just give me one more second. Jamie, what did, what did you do before? Do you do any sort of bestie read throughs or anything like that before um, you send it off or before you start self editing? Um, not really. Mm -hmm. My issue is that I'm overcoming a perfectionism problem. Mm -hmm. And so for me to share something that I don't think is the best it can possibly be is a giant hurdle that I have to personally leap over. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it really super tricky when you have to show up at writing group with something that you feel is polished because I feel like it has to be going to the publisher tomorrow. So it's really difficult for me to reach out with something that's what I consider to be mediocre. And so attempts I have done to do that have been sort of like exposure therapy for me uh -huh. <laughs> and less about finding a process, more about being imperfect um, on purpose. And mm -hmm. so it's unfortunate that I don't have much to offer there. However, like my first novel isn't published yet either. So that's where I'm at. Gotcha. All right. So it was, I'm a share screen now. It was uh, the Grammar Factory Publishing Company. We know nothing about this publishing company. We're not endorsing this publishing company. I repeat, we are not endorsing this publishing company. But the way that they have this 
We really um, like their graphic. We love their graphic, mm-hmm. and it makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense because as a former teacher, I, I, I use triangles a lot with writing, and this made a lot of sense to me. So if you look at the top, it says types of editing explained, and the, the widest, biggest, broadest type of editing will be your first step, and they have it split in between two, structural edit and developmental edit. We personally, that kind of comes around the same time. So, um, I'm going to try to go in. It's probably hard for everybody to see this. It looked better on screen when, there we go. We're going to start right there. So for them, they say that a structural edit is reorganizing the structure, consolidating repetition, cutting back rambling, new content suggestions. So see, we're still like kind of in the drafting stage a little bit. Uh, and then a yeah. developmental mm-hmm. edit, reviewing and providing a written report on the book structure and content. We do not do written reports. I'll be completely honest. We don't do that part. So uh, this, I totally understand this level. Yeah. I have never used this level, I don't think, except for writing group. If you're part writing of a writing group, group mm-hmm. you get this kind of feedback. And that's what we have used is writing group for this level. Have you got any of you ladies ever used a structural or a developmental editor? Not a professional. Well, I can't say not a professional one, not one that I paid. Okay. <laughs> so I we'll, we'll a, talk about that next week. I had a group of beta readers um, mm-hmm. with my first book. And before I really understood what that meant, mm-hmm. I called, so I called them beta readers. And I sent out my manuscript. And one of the people that got it, who um, was the English professor at the University of Washington. Mm-hmm. And she sent me a written report. (laughs) And basically, I used her written report to decide that I was completely rewriting the book. Mm. um, Because it was very professionally done, and it was very thorough, and it was very helpful. And I think that's important when we're thinking about developmental edit. That's the point you're at in the book. You may have to go back and rewrite a lot if you're going to use a developmental editor. So um, this would be something that, like, if you're new to writing... If um, the book just isn't working for you, if you don't have a strong writing group that you can rely on throughout the process of the writing, you may need to hire or find a developmental editor. This is how I feel about that right there. I also feel like this is something if, you know, all of those options, Jen said, yes, and Mm -hmm. you can consider incorporating this into your self-edit. So um, when you approach your self-edit, you can say, is there a lot of repetition? Am I rambling? Is is there something missing that would enhance the reader experience? And so if you find that um, you incorporate these structural and developmental edits into your own self-editing process, then you probably will have a stronger product at the end of the day. I mean, if you just read what it says, like consolidating repetition, well, yeah, super helpful. Mm-hmm. And um, if you just kind of approach yourself at it with these key things in mind, that probably would serve you well. Agreed. All right. So now the next level down is at it is the level that we definitely use. Yes. So copy edit is the level where once I've done all my self editing, I've, you know, utilized beta or um, alpha readers. Possibly I have looked for repetition. I've done everything I can in my power to make it the best possible manuscript. Then I sent it off for a copy edit. Now, this is a level that I just called my editor. <laughs> this yeah. is why it was good for us to have this graphic because there's so many different names out there. And again, if you Google it, you're going to see there's a there's some websites that list out eight different editors. This is the simplified version. So when I say editor, I mean my copy editor. And this for is sure. where they are gonna, they're going to look at the story as a whole. They're going to read it, but they are hopefully not going to be coming up with plot holes. Hopefully you've taken care of that at this point. Hopefully they're not going to be able to find a whole lot of repetitions. Sometimes, sometimes she comes back and says, you know, you use this word a lot, (laughs) you know, and then I would have to go back and, and work on that. Cause some come, sometimes you're blind to that, you know, but the copy edit stage is where you've given them the book or in a digital format. They're reviewing the paragraph structure, sentence structure, the tone, um, how the readability, they will find speller spelling and grammar. Um, they will give you some feedback on content. Um, but mostly it is to, is the structure of the book. And I want to move over to the side here. I forgot about the side over here. 
I love this too about the graphic level of details. The two ones that we talked about before is at the chapter level. So mm -hmm. if you're going to do developmental editing, whether it's with like how G Tina's doing with alpha, or you're going to hire somebody alpha readers or hire somebody, you're sending them a chapter at a time. You're working by the chapters. By the time that you get to um, the next level, they're going to be looking, they're going to get deeper and they're going to start looking at your paragraphs and your sentences. When yes. Jamie edits for me, she looks deeper and sometimes mm -hmm. she will restructure an entire paragraph because it just works better a different way. And, or she can see that I'm using the same structure too many times and she can, and she sees it as a reader and as an editor, and then she'll fix that part. And so this is like, it gets deeper and deeper. So like you see how the upside down mm -hmm. triangle is starting to point to a better book, I guess is what we want to say. Yeah. Oh, cool. So when I answer Teresa's question, she said, I wonder which category, category content editing would fall under. I would put that under this, like with the structural and developmental edit. Right I would now. agree. Yeah. And also I think that this is really awesome because, um, when I get a piece of work and, you know, someone asks me to look at it or something, I find a lot of times that because these things at the top, which is the base of the pyramid, because it's inverted, the structural and developmental things, if those aren't handled, then editing the way that I edit is a nightmare. And I'm like, no, thank you. And I have never been able to really put my finger on the why. And it's because they haven't spent enough time personally doing these structural things, the developmental things to have a story that works from a big picture perspective. By the time mm -hmm. they bring me in to do my piece of it, it needs to at least be able to hold together enough for me to just work at the paragraph level. Yes. That's so helpful to see this graphic. Yeah. And like that, because you said before that, I mean, you do, you have edited for me, but you said you don't want to be a professional editor. You don't want to do that because, um, like, how do you like say, this is all I want from like, it's hard being an editor has to be hard because people will send you things. I'm sure that they've never even put a pass through, you know what I mean? And then you would have to go back and actually do a previous level that you're not even being hired for and never get to where you're supposed to be. Right. You know? so, right. Yeah. So this is helpful for me to be able to tell people, uh, what level, if I were to offer that as a service, it's like, I'm, I'm a copy editor. It's very handy. And, it, and it's good for you to recognize this. Cause then you can say to like the new author who has no clue, mm -hmm. um, well, you need to do these edits first mm -hmm. before you send it to me. And then you can explain to them what that is. And then they'll be like, Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I was a couple times ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we feel that the last stage of editing, first of all, so the copy editor gets a hold of it and then it'll come back to you. And guess what? You have work to do. Like you have to go through and make some decisions. You have to go through and make some changes and some fixes. There are a few times I have to rewrite. I mean, you guys know if you watch a few episodes past when um, we add when we did a um, like a, a writing group episode with my piece critique. I, critique thank you. I had to go back and rewrite part of a chapter that I had already said, done, check, like, and that was painful, like to go back and be like, oh, I'm, I'm past this. And I had to go in and do it. And I'm so glad I did. It's a better chapter for it. But at the same time, it was like, oh, but you'll have that kind of work. So just know that the copy editor is going to send you things back too. that your work is not over yet. But then comes what we consider the final edit. I'm trying to do this with my hands here. And that's your proofreader. Now they are, they are going to only be focusing on spelling, grammar, punctuation, consistency, typos. The way that I handle proofreading is I, once I get my manuscript back from the copy editor, once I've made all of those changes and polished it all up, then I put my book in paperback form. I upload it to Ingram Spark and I upload it to, um, not, I'm not sorry, not Ingram Spark. I upload it to Amazon. And then I order a proof copy because not only do I get to see what the cover is going to look like and see if there's any mistakes or problems, but then I take my proof copy to my editor, my copy edit, my proofreader, excuse me, because things will happen in the formatting process and she will catch those things. 
you know, like sometimes like a, a sentence gets cut off or they're just, they're just like weird typo problems. Or if there's formatting issues, formatting issues, she'll yeah. catch that. And I could read through my book again, but first of all, I'm over it at that point. Second you of all, don't see it. I, do, I don't see it. And she's seeing it with fresh eyes. And, and scoot, scoot the image over to the level that it's at. I just want everyone to see this is the word level words. So yes. this is like the deeper. Mm hmm. Now, she's not going to give me suggestions on a better word or a, um, you know, you use it. She will like literally find typos and problems like that. And I'm, let me show you, this is my most recent book. And here's what I got back from her. Can you see this? And I'm telling you, this, these are all post-it notes for those of you listening. This is after all the edits I tell you that I go through. And this is after Jamie and then me fixing all the things with Jamie. Here's. The same, the same copy editor right here. All these things here. I keep saying copy editor. I'm sorry. Proofreader. Proofreader. There will still be problems. And guess what? There'll still be problems after that because that's just how it is. Like, I don't know that you could ever have a perfect book, but you need to have it pretty darn close in my opinion because I want to be proud of the work I put out there. Right. Well, and it's interesting too at the proofreader level dealing with words. And it's just so interesting to think about because I'm pretty sure that as a proofreader going through, you know, you'll read a sentence and do the comma action and everything, but it makes me wonder how much of the plot even soaks into the proofreader's brain because of the type of work that they're doing, mm -hmm. which is why you can't expect a copy editor to catch all of your comma and semicolon and apostrophe mistakes because their brain is working at the paragraph and like context. They're not yes. looking for marks and you know what I'm saying? Like it's yes. a different focus. And this is why we think that these three are bare bones and you could probably handle the top level, the structural stuff yourself, mm -hmm. but then find someone else because you need to be removed from it to do, I think this level of editing at the bottom two tiers. And I like the point that Piper just made that she believes proof, proofreading is supposed to be looking at the formatted manuscript to see mm. the, where the hyphenation mm -hmm. spacing, et cetera, needs fixing to. Yeah. yeah. Proof point. copy. That makes That's sense. Right. They're looking at the proof, right? Yeah. And if you can find like two people to be proofreaders for you, if you can finance that, if you have the finances for that, or you can find like, and we'll talk about finding editors next week, you may want to send out an ebook version to someone else to lo be looking for the same things because mm. I format using Vellum and it automatically does my ebook and my print copy at the same time. But does it mean that they're going to look exactly the same? They don't, they look different and there might be issues with the ebook that I haven't noticed. So, yeah. That's so fine. all of these things, like we didn't want, this is not to scare you. This is not like, oh my gosh, I have to do all this. I have to hire all this. I don't have the mm -hmm. money. Listen, that's what next week is for. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about this next week, but we didn't feel that we could talk about how do you find an editor without talking about the different kinds of editors? Because sure. again, there's so much, I don't want to say misinformation. There's so much different types of there's different types of information out there. There's and a lack we, of consensus. There's a lack of consensus. And before <laughs> we could give you our advice on how to find one, we had to talk to you about how, what we see as editors in the terminology. So that's what this episode was about. Yes. Great. Again, that was Grammar Factory. Um, there are types of editing explained. If you want to Google search that, I'm sure you can come up with it. It's a great graphic. We really appreciate that, appreciate that they had put that on their blog. It was very helpful to us, and we hope it was helpful to you. Yes. Speaking of helpful, I hope that it's helpful for you to listen to us read our writing because it's one of our favorite parts of the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Every yeah. week after our content every week before we even start we sit down and we sprint for 15 minutes to a writing prompt and because we don't edit it because we don't even look at it again before we read it live <laughs> when we give our feedback we it is only positive and encouraging feedback if you want to see us do critiquing like we would do in a, a writing group you can look a couple episodes back we critiqued each other's writing um previously to this uh, all three of us actually were on the chopping block for a while. And that's not the right term, right? The chopping block. That means we're I getting love rid it. Of you. I know. <laughs> I misuse idioms all the time. <laughs> all the time. We've been at this for four years, ladies. We've been at this almost four years. Wow. 
crazy. That's the okay. Same right now. So I'm going to start with you, Tina. Okay. Would you please read for us what the sprint prompt was and then share your piece. Okay. Well, we had five words mm -hmm. and those words were belt, indirect, responsibility, injury, and swipe. And I might have used one of them and I <laughs> used the, the, the spirit of another one. Okay. <laughs> I meant to use it and then it didn't end up in the sentence is what happened. And I accidentally wrote a romance. <gasps> wow. Yeah, I'd be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it, I don't know if it's going to be a happy ending then though. So I don't know. So it won't be a romance then. Women's lit. I, I just don't know. It's not okay. done. So I don't okay. know what it is. Here we go. <laughs> Robin sat woodenly in her seat. The courtroom buzzed around her, but she pretended to be intensely engaged on something on her phone. But indirectly, she watched the man who was standing by the witness box, one hand in the air, one hand on the Bible. The sandy blonde hair of his youth had given way to a close buzz, most likely to lessen the impact of his receding hairline, and his face was weathered, though not overly so. However, his eyes, they hadn't changed. Still gray like the sea on a cloudy day, still firm but kind. None of the other stuff mattered. She wasn't disappointed that the body of the 21-year-old she'd loved was a bit thicker, or that his belly wasn't flat, but it was the eyes that had always done it for her. Sheriff Reynolds, could you please tell the court why you were back on the stand today? I just wanted to set the record straight about the motive Miss Leopard gave for Mrs. Brocious coming after her and necessitating her supposedly needing to defend herself. Robin cringed as at his use of Mrs. before her name. She'd let him believe the ring on her hand meant she was still married. She hadn't lied, really. She just let him believe what it told him. Hmm. Mrs. Leopard claims Mrs. Miss Leopard claims Mrs. Brocious was jealous because nobody loves her, but that simply isn't the truth. Could you explain what you mean by that, Sheriff? said the wow. lawyer. Yes. The statement that nobody loves Mrs. Brocious simply isn't true. She has a husband who, if he were here, I'm sure would tell you he loves her. Mm. Mm. Heat rose into her face. She met his eyes then. Did he know the truth? She saw no hang anger in the gray of his eyes that seemed to swell like an ocean wave. Not taking his gaze from hers, he said, but I can tell you that I love her. I fell in love with her the first moment I laid eyes on her, and I have loved her for the 40 years since. Three, two, one. Aww. Aww. It is a happy ending. If, you, if that's the ending. <laughs> I mean, that could be a full story, short story right there. Yeah. Like, I love later in life romance. I need to somehow get all of these other projects off my plate so I can write one. First of all, her last name, I love it. Are you saying Brocious? Brocious, yeah. What is, like, spell that. I love it. B-R-O-T-I-O-U-S. And is that a name you've heard before? Did that just pop yes. in your little head? Yeah, I love it. I love recycling names that you love in real life. Very, very good. Piper very says, aw. <laughs> we all said aw. It was like stereo. Yeah. And some <laughs> random new uh, commenter named Randy Tong says, well, why are you not writing romance, Tina? Because then your wife will have a run for her money, Randy. <laughs> they, they don't make enough emesis basins for that. <laughs> that says, oh tina's so sweet i agree that was very i sweet. do yeah that was great it. and he said it while making eye contact too yes Aww. and he mm -hmm. just put his hand on the bible can i just point that out oh, <laughs> he <yeah>. means it <laughs> shell says love the focus on his eyes and all your descriptions thanks guys piper says i'm lost on who attacked who but i have to admit i'm a sucker for the eyes yeah yeah. And Barbara says, wow, Tina did write a, ro a romance. Yes. <laughs> yes. I can see you writing rom-com. Like, oh, yeah. All the mishaps sure. that would happen. And yeah. Well, so, you know, it was really a crime drama. <laughs> it's just what's seen <laughs> out of a crime drama. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh -huh. All right. Mm -hmm. Moving along. I will go next. And mine is a romance. Shocker. So surprised. Um, I know, right? And it is going to be from my Widows of the West series, but it's not from the book one. Mm. So um, I don't know. These names are not staying. I could not think of a name for this dude. But anyways, okay. So this is going to be later in the series. It's just a scratch. 
Maverick, watch the pretty doctor ripe, wipe, swipe. See, that's our word. I can't even yes. say it right. Maverick watched the pretty doctor swipe at an errant curl that continued to fall over her brow, wrinkled with concentration. She didn't look up at him as she worked to pull his boot off. Despite his efforts to remain stoic, their movement caused him more pain than he expected, and a sharp hiss escaped his lips. At the sound, she finally looked up at him, her cornflower blue eyes locking on his face. Give me your belt, she said. Excuse me? You heard me. Now do as I say and give me your belt. Although most days Maverick would have chosen to wear suspenders, for some reason today he had chosen to wear a belt, the only one he owned, the one with the Union officer's buckle. Not only did he loathe to part with the piece for, memorabil for memorabilia's sake, but also for modesty's sake. My pants will fall down, he said, closing the matter in his mind. She huffed. Sir, I've seen far more than you're hiding. I'm a doctor. You ain't like no doctor I've ever seen, he said, shaking his head violently. She stood to her full height, which wasn't much, and moved to the head of the table Maverick laid on. Mr. Phillips, your injury is worse than you think, and you are losing blood quickly, and I need your belt to stop the flow. Either you take it off, she said as she rolled her, her sleeves, or I will. He laughed, but his mirth was cut short as one reached for his <laughs> groin area. Three, two, one. That's where I ended. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, I love the detail of her swiping at a curl. I know that that was a word, but it really was great because now we know she's got this curly hair just like that. Yeah, that was I just love that. And oh, I, okay. I love this idea. Of, like, look, I am here doing a job. You obviously do not understand how serious this situation is. You're worried about like your pants falling down. Like, was he bitten by a snake or like, what? I don't even I wonder, know. Right? Who like, who knows? How He's funny bleeding. is this scene? And she's just like, I'm just trying to like fix the car, you know, don't right. make this be all about like, Oh, it's your body and modesty <laughs> and stuff like that. It is great. I love this scene. Thank you. I found a book, uh, a, a nonfiction book about women doctors in uh, the Old West. And I was like, what? And I was all excited. So, of course, <laughs> of course, I'm going to have a woman doctor, right? Yeah. I'm super excited about it. But yeah, Piper like says, free. you ain't like no doctor I've ever seen. Love it. <laughs> yes, for sure. And she said that was so fun, Jen. And then yes. Shell said, yes, so sassy. <laughs> and then Barbara says, sounds like he's going to learn not to let mess with the lady doc. LOL. Right. <laughs> As somebody who's worked in the medical field and had to do many, um, I didn't do the exams. I had to be in the room while exams were done of a personal uh -huh. nature. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, like, you just don't even. Right. You've seen so many. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And, but back then, think about it. Like yeah. it's a woman and like yeah. it's the old West. So there's probably yeah. not as many women or there aren't as many women around. And then here she comes in, she's going to be from the East coast. Because mm -hmm. that's where all the hospital doctors, there's all, all the schools are. And yeah. So. And unfortunately cute. If she oh, were like I, haggish or something, it might not be right. such a big deal. And the, if she looked like a some... mother or something like that. But as you read these books, you're going to see that like this person thinks she's cute, but maybe others don't. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, you know, there's things about Colleen and Kay, they find attractive each other, but maybe another person, like I'm not making them read my, these characters real ridiculously attractive but love to it. the other person just like real life right love it yeah mm -hmm. and so. there were a lot of conventions back then about what you do and don't do in front of a lady and it ain't yes. right proper yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. and so, uh he's probably not that. showered in a long time mm -hmm. like there's there's yeah. a lot i could do with this scene yeah that was yeah. good i liked it Teresa says so fun also oh, thanks Teresa. i appreciate that and i just love that you said groin so yeah. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, think it's Tina acceptable, and Jennifer, right? Like swapped shifts or something on me. Right. They did a, a face swap. <laughs> All right. All right, Jamie, let's hear what you got. All right. Here comes Jamie to bring down the room. All right. Oh, while you're doing that too, I just want to say mine was short because I did go do some research. Sorry. The word belt threw me, but it's true. They, they didn't wear belts, but there were belts in the Civil War. And afterwards, cowboys, that's where the cowboy belt buckle came from. Wow. Because the, they they were given um, belt buckles that would say what, what what they were, what they were in the army, basically. And like they wore it with pride afterwards. 
And, and you so, wonder, did suspenders wow. go out of quote unquote fashion or was it more comfortable when you're on a horse to not have something pulling on your shoulders? Do you yeah, know what I'm know. saying? Like, yeah, anyway. Most, it didn't become common, but they did have them. So anyways, hmm. sorry. I had to get the historical in there. No, I love it. I appreciate that. All right. <clears throat> so I think I just got the one uh, word, but like Tina, I, I meant for others to come in, whatever. Shh, shh. I offered, mm -hmm. slathering the sticky paste onto the tender skin as gently as I could. The tallow-based salve softened upon meeting the warm flesh and made my work easier, and I hoped that the cooling effects of the balm were as present on Lorelei's thigh as they were on my fingers. I knew she wasn't fit to recognize any such benefit, worked up as she was, but who could blame her? Encountering Pa in his belt was enough to send a person to another place for quite some time. Mm. Shh, I said again, trying not to become irritated with her. It wasn't her fault. I knew that my words and my attentions did nothing to calm her. She'd flip that switch in the mind that turns the responsibility for all things over to the part of us that keeps us breathing and blinking. And her actual self was far from me, backed into some dark corner somewhere, if mm. she was anything like me. I considered she, went, she wasn't much like me at all. And for the first time, I wondered if the place she went was somewhere happy and bright. Somewhere pain like this doesn't exist and all sorts of happiness is possible instead of the dark and lonely place of all things forgotten that my mind is inclined to run off to. Mm -hmm. She was all snotted up from the crying and I tried to give her a towel for her face, but she only looked at it with vacant eyes, her body still spasming with sobs. You're going to have to come back on to come on back to me now, I said. Come on back now, Lorelei. But I dropped the towel onto her stomach and grabbed another to start working the solve off my hands. I wanted, with every fiber of my being, to stay down there with her, crouch down and snuggle together for long enough. I wondered if maybe some of her light would rub off on me. But I knew better than that, knew that my leaning into her escape would only mean prolonged darkness for us both. So instead, I put my hands on my hips and evaluated the state of things. There was still sweeping to be done and supper to be made. Someone would have to fetch water. And though the sympathetic thing to do would have been to grab the bucket and head off for it myself, I opted for the pragmatic thing to do instead and snatched the rusty pail from its hook and set it down next to the still sobbing Lorelei. I set it down harder than I had to. She didn't need to know I was sympathetic. It clanged and the handle clattered. She jumped. Good, I thought, recognizing the sound as anchoring. I was right. The spasm stopped and after a moment, her fist unclenched for long enough for her to take up the towel. She swiped it across her eyes and then blew her nose into it. Chores has still got to be done, I said though I didn't need to say it. She gave an almost imperceptible nod, then scrambled to her feet. She flung the towel over her shoulder and headed for the door. Hey, I called to her back. She didn't stop, so I called again. She turned to look at me. I said nothing but lifted a brow. You gonna be okay? The gesture telegraphed to her. Her response was not a smile nor a nod, but rather a subtle rightening of her posture. Three, two, one. Oh my gosh, Jamie. So many things I love about this. Okay, where to start? Okay, so I probably would have written the character that she would have gone off and done it for her and she'd have been the strong one and blah, blah, blah. But you didn't write it that way. And it's so much better because you still show the character, the narrator character still having a strength that I don't know where she's getting the strength from, but then she's trying to embody that strength into this Lorelai. Like, oh my gosh, there's just so many things. This has got it. This is turning into a novel, right? It has to mm. like, I feel like it is coming out of you and bubbling out of you. Like it's a novel that it's forcing its way out of you. It's so good. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Like these, this person is very real to me in the mm. way that my characters are, that I end up writing something that I really want to see out there. So I'm feeling mm. the same, but I just don't know yet because it's such a big story and yeah. uh, it's historically set and mm -hmm. so it's going to take some time to do. But the historical stuff you can fix later. Right. Right. You no, know? I mean, like, mm -hmm. and that's coming from a historical writer. I like to like kind of know beforehand, but you're a discovery writer. And I think that you can write this with the feel of a historical and we can fix the historical later, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. What I really liked about that piece was, um, <clears throat> It being from the point of view of somebody who had been traumatized mm. in the same way that the person that was actually traumatized in this scene was. Mm -hmm. And I feel like she 
knew what that girl needed because she had been traumatized. Yeah. Like she needed to be grounded. She needed to come back to herself. <clears throat> and all those details were so real to me. Mm -hmm. I just loved the whole thing. I'm glad to hear that, Tina. Yeah, same. Piper Sorry says, to hear it, but I'm glad to hear that it was real for you. Yeah. Piper says, oh, my gosh, Jamie. And Shell says, oh, Jamie, give me chills. Love, but a little tough love, too. Great character sketch. Thank you. Barbara says, word rich in great way. Wonderful show, not tell. Absolutely. I agree with that. And Piper says, wow, just wow. You have such a way with writing, Jamie. Agreed. Thanks, everybody. I love Friday. <laughs> <laughs> It's the best day of the week. It is. For sure. Okay. Well, we're about to wrap up this, this episode. And before we do, we want to end with our what's next. It's where we share some accountability time and share with each other. Also with our chat, uh, what's going to happen in this next week between now and next Friday. So Jamie, let's just go backwards and start with you. What's next for you? Um, I don't know what to say is next. As far as accountability goes, I have not been writing like this Friday sprint was the first writing I've done in a really long time, but then I'm like super extra awfully busy. And I hate mm -hmm. when people say I'm busy as an excuse not to do something, but this is not an excuse. This is just literally like, uh, okay. And the reason is because you feel like, well, did I scroll TikTok at all this week? And then if you say yes, well, that's the time you could have spent writing. But like, if you can't do it, you can't do it. Like your brain is just a jello pudding pop and you have to like, uh, veg for five minutes. Like do you remember it's not what, possible to do everything. Do you remember what our friend Becca said when she was on our show last and I was struggling and she's like, just because you have time doesn't mean that it's productive. Like it's time that you can write with. It's not, <sighs> you know, like yeah. it doesn't mean that you're, that you are in a place or your mind is in a place that is actually writing time. It's so, just really hard to balance what you want to have in the future with your actions of today. And it's girl. something that I'm working hard on to try to figure out. So I appreciate, I know everybody prays for me and let me tell you, I've been feeling it. So thanks a million, everyone. And it could just be a season. You yeah. Know, I've, you know, like I, I couldn't, there was just, I just couldn't. And I'm still, yeah. I'm still kind of wallowing in that sorrow a bit and it's getting better. But it's a season and I just keep reminding myself that I won't always be like this. Like, you know, it will change, you know, the Thanks, sun rises Jen. again tomorrow. So That's encouraging, Jen. I appreciate yeah. it. What's next the, for you? Well, more editing. So again, I'm trying to not wallow all the time and I am getting some <laughs> editing and it is going slow. Um, but, you know, gosh, it's September and I would like this book out in November. So mm. I, I got to get my act together because it is a Me Christmas. Me too then. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. You'll leave a couple more to do. Yeah. A couple more. Um, it is technically a Christmas book, technically. So I would like to get it out. Um, sure. So, yeah. So that's, that's what's up for me. Uh, before we go to you, uh, Tina Piper says her what's up, her what ups, uh, what's next? I saw the up there and it threw me. I'm sending the manuscript to my editor this weekend. Yay. I'll start working on That's the blurb amazing. to get ready for the cover. Yay. Oh, the blurb. Oh, it'll <laughs> be fine. of the blurb. The shredded the blurb. blurb. The blurb. Teresa says, what's next? I've got to focus on work until I get through a big meeting in October 11th. But I'm going to try and spend at least an hour each morning in my story world and working out the plot. All right, Tina, what's next for you? Well, I have, from this quarter, I have set my goals in 10,000 word increments. Mm -hmm. And so I have a bunch of little sticky things that say 10,000 words on them. And so I'm mm -hmm. working on my next 10,000 words. And awesome. then as I get them done, I'm getting them ready to send out to alpha readers as mm -hmm. they return one questionnaire. I'm going to send them the next 10,000 words. Um, and that's it. And I have a book thing tomorrow. And if you if you live in Michigan and end up coming, tell me who you are when you come to my mm. booth. Because sometimes people do not look like they are a picture on Facebook. What are you talking about? Are you saying that I don't look like my picture? <laughs> I totally don't. What I'm so. saying is that seeing somebody in, in person sometimes it's hard to connect them with if when you've only seen a picture on Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I agree. The Plus, other way around is easier. Like if you know someone in real life and then you mm -hmm. see a picture, it's easier to make those connections. Yeah. Plus we're old. And so our memories aren't great. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate everyone who was here. We thank you so much for those of you that take your time to listen to this podcast and to support it. And if you do enjoy what you, like we said, tell someone else about it, uh, share the podcast episodes. We want to reach out to other Christian writers who just are struggling for community and are looking for this. So until next week, may your pen be prolific. May your deadlines be met and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. Bye now.